Hello, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, this is our last Wednesday seminar. I know that we were all having a good time this semester. And uh, in so many different ways, we save the best for last. Um, and um, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Sima Shahsari, uh, who is an associate professor and former chair of the Department of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Minnesota. <coughs> um, uh, when I say that somebody was a chair, it weighs so heavily on me because I know what people go through when they're <laughs> department chairs. <you> know. <clears throat> they received a PhD in cultural and social anthropology from Stanford University uh, and an MA in women, gender, and sexuality studies at San Francisco uh, State University uh, and uh, have held postdoctoral positions at the University of Pennsylvania's Wolf uh, Humanities Center and Women's and Gender Studies Department of the University of Houston. <clears throat> Their areas of specialization, uh, which is quite broad, um, um, includes transnational feminist theory, transnational sexuality studies, queer theory, transgender studies, critical refugee studies, diaspora studies, neoliberal governmentality, biopolitics and necropolitics, civil society, digital media. And uh, they deliver on all those counts, so uh, it's not just on the paper. <coughs> uh, uh, Professor Shah Sari's book titled Politics of Rightful Killing, Civil Society, Gender and Sexuality in the Blagistan, which was published uh, by Duke University Press in 2020, and uh, we had the privilege of having uh, their book launch uh, a couple of years ago, unfortunately during COVID, and it was on, the, uh, on that damned Zoom meetings. You know. <clears throat> we are liberated from Zoom meetings. It's such a pleasure. Uh, and uh, uh, their book uh, received the Fatima Mernisi Book Award, honorable mention from the Middle East Studies Association, Shah Sari's uh, current research focuses on movements as a corporeal, affective, and political assemblage in relation to gender and sexuality in Iranian diaspora. Please help me to welcome Professor Shah Sari. Thank you so much, Behruz John. Um, for that generous introduction. It is on. I swear to God, it is on. Um, maybe it's not close enough. Um, thank you all for being here. And uh, many thanks to uh, the Center for Iranian and Persian Gulf Studies here at Princeton um, and everyone who helped this happen, Allison in particular, who has been uh, very generous with their time. Uh, and of course, uh, Behruz for uh, inviting me again, this time in person. So uh, my talk was supposed to be initially on um, a chapter of a book called The Cunning of Gender Violence, which was recently published um, uh, by Duke University Press. And um, the chapter I have in that book is on uh, my research, which is on uh, queer and trans refugee applicants in Turkey, and that particular chapter was on the discourse on torture and how um, the violence of uh, human rights regimes, refugee rights regimes in particular, uh, is basically erased in the uh, uh, refugee discourse through uh, this idea of torture uh, where uh, Iranian uh, trans refugees are seen as survivors of torture and therefore their cases is supposed to be accelerated, although it's not, uh, because uh, the uh, gender affirming surgeries in Iran are considered by UNHCR uh, to be a form of torture, and this discourse has been actually produced by Iranian diasporic opposition groups, uh, in particular in Europe. So that was supposed to be uh, the talk, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. 
as you saw probably on uh, the flyer, I'm going to talk about Palestine. And that is because I, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think it makes sense to talk about anything else when we are witnessing a genocide. And um, I will talk about it as a genocide. I know that the poster says massacre, but I really think what we are witnessing is a genocide, and I will say why. Um, but uh, other than the fact that uh, it is, I see it as my ethical and intellectual responsibility to talk about Palestine in these times, uh, the three co-editors of the book, The Cunning of Gender Violence, are Palestinian, Laila Abu Lughud, um, Rima Hammami, and uh, Nader Shalhoub Kevorkian. Some of you may know that Nader Shalhoub Kevorkian was asked to resign from Hebrew University for signing a letter that basically critiqued the state of Israel for uh, the massacre of Palestinian children. And uh, Rima Hamami teaches at Berzeit University, and they have to teach on Zoom now exactly because of the violence uh, that is going on in Palestine. So. Uh, I, uh, I, I want to talk about, uh, you know, I know that this is the Iran Center for Iranian Studies, so uh, many of you, of course, know about uh, the history of Palestine and what's going on, so I'm not going to talk about that. It's not a Palestine 101 talk, don't worry. I'm going to try to make it uh, relevant to Iranian studies, and what has been really bothering me, and I talked to uh, Behrouz in his office earlier today, is the silence of our Iranian studies colleagues. Uh, in particular, uh, feminist and queer studies colleagues who have been quite silent when it comes to thinking about Palestine. And some of them uh, were very uh, vocal and loud last year, talking about the woman life freedom, but then are quite um, you know, silent today. So I want to talk about why we are witnessing this silence and uh, what it means. Um, and of course, you know, many of you know, I haven't checked the news this morning because I left the, uh, I live in Minnesota, so I left the house at 4 a.m. Um, but as of yesterday, over 21,000 Palestinians in Gaza uh, uh, were killed since October 7th. And so uh, what we are witnessing is really a genocide. And some people, you know, rather than actually opposing it, are uh, busy discussing whether it is a genocide or not, you know, rather than actually stopping what's happening. Um, but I very firmly believe what we are uh, witnessing is a genocide, and this is the legal definition, Article 6 of the Rome Statute for International Criminal Court and Art Article 2 of Genocide Convention, which basically uh, defines genocide as uh, acts committed with the specific intent to destroy either in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. These acts encompass killing members of the group, causing them serious harm, and imposing conditions of life aimed at physical destruction of the group in whole or in part, among other underlying acts. Notably, the people targeted can be a geographically limited part of the group. So I don't know what you call when 21,000 people uh, are killed in uh, an area that is basically 25 miles by six miles. When I, uh, when the person uh, who picked me up from the airport, I looked at the distance is 45 miles. So imagine going half of the distance to the airport. That is Gaza, six miles wide, uh, wide, and 2.3 million people cramped in that area, being bombed every day, nonstop, except for the so-called um, humanitarian pause, which basically. Uh, is not humanitarian when you're killing more people and arresting more people in West Bank while uh, releasing some hostages in Gaza. So uh, I'm going to refer this to genocide, and this is exactly why, because I believe that it is basically a systematic annihil uh, annihilation of the Palestinian population in Gaza. Um, so before talking about why uh, this silence among Iranian feminists. Uh, of course, I'm not talking about all Iranian feminists. There are uh, some Iranian feminists, a handful of people who have been vocal about Palestine. But for the most part, uh, you know, I think many of us can agree that there has been this silence. But before talking about that, I want to um, say that I come from a transnational feminist theory and praxis training. Uh, and the approach that I take, uh, which is a transnational feminist approach, 
pays attention to inequalities of power in a transnational context. That means thinking about the histories and the present of colonialism, empire, class, race, gender, sexuality, religion, and ability, not as fixed categories of analysis, but as assemblages that are constantly in flux and take part in the government of life and death in different temporal and spatial contexts. Ella Habiba Shohat, the Iraqi Arab Jewish or Mizrahim feminist scholar, introduced this term or the relational approach um, in her book Taboo Memories in the 90s, where she made connections between the 15th century con conquesta uh, and um, Columbus's so called discovery and the expulsion of Jews and Muslims from Spain at the same time. Uh, Shohat connects these histories not to draw parallel parallels between settler colonialism in the Americas and Palestine, but to highlight the historical connections that are erased in the Zionist nationalist narratives of the 19th century, which were instrumental in the formation of the Israeli settler colonial state in 1948. Zionism as a modern nationalist movement has discursively produced a fabricated unified Jewish identity with an immemorial common past and a common future seemingly represented and protected by the state of Israel which legitimizes its settler colonialism uh, on the Palestinian land based on the experiences of persecution of European Jews. This nationalist discourse privileges or privileged and still does Ashkenazi Jews as the ideal type citizens of the Zionist nation state, pathologizes diaspora Jews as unmanly and weak, and erases any trace of the existence of Mizrahi or Sephardic Jews in Palestine. And as Shohat argues, this racialized ideal type was crystallized in the figure of Sabra, a hyper-masculine, able-bodied, cis white Jewish man who explored the flora and fauna of Palestine, uh, which was considered to be an empty land to be explored and conquered. And when I say transnational feminist scholarship, I mean something completely different than a global feminist approach that organizes its analysis of gender around a fixed and universal category of woman. And I also mean something very different than the global queer scholarship that assumes a universal queer identity that privileges white European sexual identities as the yardstick of progress. This matters, as you will see, uh, because as I will show in this talk, this universalized categories, woman or queer, are deployed by the Israeli propaganda machine to garner support for the Israeli apartheid regime and the settler colonial violence through appropriations of feminism and in the name of women's liberation or queer li liberation against a common enemy, Islamism. When I talk about transnational feminist approach, I mean an approach that takes seriously, as I said, the past and present of colonialism and settler colonialism, geopolitics, neoliberal economies, security regimes, and their connections to how gender and sexuality are articulated in national and transnational contexts. And it is also different from an international comparative approach, which compares the conditions of uh, life or freedoms of women and queers in different locations by assuming the sovereignty of nation. In a world where nation states obviously matter, as we can see with, you know, um, the immigration laws and our rise of nationalisms, and of course, you know, in the context of Palestine, which queers can actually go um, to Israel and enjoy the so called free queer life there. Um, so, uh, you know, th again, I'm not saying that nation states do not matter, but uh, where the idea of sovereignty of nations, international laws, and international human rights are complicated by uneven geopolitical uh, relations, imperialism, colonialism, and settler colonialism, diasporas, human rights regimes, finance capital, and neoliberal economies, security regimes, and media technologies, a transnational feminist approach asks us to go beyond the comp comparative method to women and queers as already existing categories, and to think critically about the neoliberal parlances of freedom or the limited framework of universal human rights. So having said this, let me delve into what I mentioned before, the silence of many Iranian feminists in the face of this genocide. I forgot to say um, that 
other than uh, you know the reasons that I mentioned why I'm talking about Palestine. The kafia I'm wearing is from Hebron. It's a Herbabi kafia that was gifted to me uh, by Insight Women of Color Palestine Force. Um, and when I took this kafia, uh, I made a pledge to never stop talking about Palestine uh, until Palestine is free. And as um, a way to honor all the Palestinians who were killed, including uh, Heba Zagut, uh, an um, uh, artist, a Palestinian artist who was killed on October 13 with her two children in Gaza. Um, and of course, you know, this uh, pledge is uh, to all the people of Gaza and uh, in the memory of uh, Heba, who was a part of the Palestinian feminist uh, collective uh, with which I'm affiliated. Uh, so, uh, the reasons that I think there is this kind of um, silence among some of the Iranian feminist scholars uh, is one, the naturalization of colonial uh, binary uh, or the logic, the kind of binary logic. Zionism relies on modern colonial binary oppositions. These include uh, binaries of Arab versus Jew, which in turn correspond with irrational rational barbaric, civilized, subhuman, human. We all remember um, Yaouf Galant's uh, uh, statement calling people in Gaza or Palestinians uh, human animals. Uh, and other binaries that correspond to the binary of Arab Jew, theocratic, democratic, terrorist, um, and innocent victim. Uh, victim. We see this in uh, all colonial contexts, of course. Uh, Israel is not an exception. Uh, but you know, where the European colonizer justifies its colonial violence under the rhetoric of civilizing the backward other. We still see this rational, irrational framing um, in these discourses of the rational self-defense of Israel versus um, the um, uh, irrational terrorism of Palestinians. And of course, you know, we can't ever talk about uh, the attacks that Hamas did as a form of resistance because God forbid, then you're doomed. If you think about, well, what kinds of violence are considered to be legitimate violence and what kinds of violence are um, not? So this civilization or bin uh, uh, binary underlies the conflation of Hamas, the Islamic Republic of Iran, Taliban, Daesh, under the banner of Islamism and as the common enemy. Never mind the very, vast differences in the histories of formation of all of these, but um, this conflation uh, often happens um, to create this idea of Islamism or um, jihadists. Not unlike the so-called war on terror, Islam stands for repression, while Israel, a state that is organized around the religion, is cast as progressive. Islamism, or as some scholars, including a feminist scholar that many of you probably know, uh, who it is that I'm talking about, um, basically uh, use this term jihadist as the stick figure of a monstrous enemy um, uh, that poses a threat for all women and the so-called international community. In this Manichaean logic, Israelis as victims of terrorism and Muslim women as victims of Islamic patriarchy become united against this common foe the Islamism or jihadists. Of course, post-colonial and transnational feminist scholarship for decades now has questioned this civilizational logic and have pointed to the instrumentalization of Muslim women as objects of rescue by colonial discourses. Yet sadly, some of our Iranian feminist colleagues seem to repeat these binaries. Interestingly, even as queer theory has questioned the binary of sex, some queer scholars also keep the civil civilizational binaries intact by repeating um, the Israeli pinkwashing discourses, where, the, um, you know, as many of you know what pinkwashing is, um, the Israeli state's brand Israel campaign since 2005, I think it's been, yeah, 2005, um, has worked hard to portray Israel uh, as the only democracy in the Middle East where queers can serve in the military and be free and so, so on and so forth. How, uh, however, as many queer scholars and activists have pointed out, images of queer beach resorts in um, Tel Aviv and happy queers enjoying freedom in Tel Aviv and Israeli cosmopolitan centers notwithstanding, there's nothing that justifies the sheer Israeli 
settler colonial violence against Palestinians in Gaza, West Bank, and the 47 Palestinians, those who live as fourth class citizens in Israel. Of course, the Israeli state has um, proactively used its um, well-funded propaganda machine um, just between October 7th and October uh, 21st. In uh, two weeks, Israel spent $7.1 million just for ads on YouTube um, to, to create you know, the kind of um, propaganda that it um, has been doing for decades, actually. Um, so <coughs> the well-funded propaganda machine, uh, Israeli propaganda machine, to deploy effective elements of fear and disgust attached to Palestinian bodies to garner sympathy for Israel. Um, and um, uh, this, this has been uh, actually quite effective if you're on social media and see the discourse that is happening in uh, um, you know, Farsi-speaking uh, social media. Uh, we have seen a, pr a proliferation of the claims that even Joe Biden repeated with no evidence, such as Hamas beheading 40 Israeli infants uh, in the October 7 attacks, a claim that IDF could not substantiate and the White House had to withdraw. Um, and of course, gender is deployed in this uh, war to legitimize the massacre of uh, 21,000, more than 21,000 Palestinians since October 7. One of the effective strategies deployed by the Israeli state, and one that I would say has had a major role in the silence of many Iranian feminists in the face of genocide in Gaza, is the monstrosity of the Muslim Palestinian man juxtaposed to the innocence of Israeli women who are allegedly raped by Hamas. This is another claim that spread very fast on social media and mainstream news, but has not been substantiated by human rights groups, even IDF um, that made these claims has not been able to prove them. Uh, let me show you an example of how the Israeli offense forces, uh, which by the way <coughs> has invested in years in pro pro uh, propaganda in the Iranian social media either directly or indirectly by funding diasporic media channels, has been using their social media to deploy the narrative of Israeli women's victimhood. This is a video that was published on November 25th, the day of um, uh, fighting against violence against women, showing graphic images of uh, Shani Luke, the a uh, woman whose body was hauled in a truck by what is supposed to be uh, Hamas soldiers and showing the clip of a woman who is taken hostage by Hamas on a motorcycle. The IOF um, soldier says in Farsi, if as a man you do not condemn such sadis uh, sadistic and savage violence against the opposite sex, then maybe you do not deserve being called a man. Uh, ignoring violence, she continues, is in fact accepting it. If you are a man, come to the Middle East and be a woman. So let me show you this clip. I actually don't want to show the graphic images in the beginning. So. Yeah. So of course, the seemingly feminist discourse, um, you know, on the violence against women um, uh, day, reproduces the hegemonic gendered notions of men as protectors of the nation and women, uh, women as victims and as men's honor. Not to mention that thousands of Palestinian women who are killed, injured, or live in Gaza without access to food, water, fuel, or medical facilities do not count as those uh, or as women who are subjected to violence. The Israeli state, um, of course, has appropriated the woman life freedom, uh, be it Netanyahu or you know, in social uh, media pro uh, propaganda uh, in the past as well. Even Yasmin Pahlavi, uh, in her trip with her husband Reza Pahlavi, uh, who is the son of the dethroned 
Shah of Iran, posted a photo of uh, an IDF woman soldier as an inspiration for woman life freedom a few months ago. Not surprisingly, these appropriations create common enemies, again, the Islamic Republic and Hamas, who oppress sisters in struggle, uh, the Israeli uh, and Iranian women alike. In another video, which was posted just a few days ago, the Israeli IOF is presented, uh, this was on 29th, uh, as a role model for Iranian women and imagines a future to which the Iranian women should aspire after the fall of the Islamic Republic. So let me show you that video. Oops. What's happening here? Why are we stuck on this one? Oh, there we go. Okay, so... غزه این افتخار داشتم با سه بانوی دلاور ارتش اسرائیل آشنا بشم این از افتی افکار که در با ریتگیرس با امدینه شلی ایلخم علمه شی خشور و نیپانه ایلخین انشید به ایران گم از این خالات لیاد اتسمایات خزکات خوبزیات و مدینه کمان و انشید به اسرائیل و نیپچونه تو دکوخ و اتسمال شارت به تو ایشاکن و بگرم ارتش دفاعی اسرائیل زنان در کنار مردان برای حق دفاع از کشور خودشون مبارزه کنید امروز در All right, so for those of you who don't speak Farsi, uh, the Persian-speaking IDF propaganda agent says that today at the Gaza border, she had the honor of meeting three IOF, uh, well, she calls them IDF, IOF lady soldiers, Banu rather than woman. Um, so uh, the first one of the soldiers says, I put aside everything to come and serve my country and for a fight for what is important. The second one says, I will tell you women of Iran, you too, can be like us women in Israel, independent, powerful, and free. The third woman says, I think it is powerful that I, as a woman, serve my country, especially with pride. Um, and uh, at the end, the conclusion is that in Israel, women like men fight for the right to defend their country. So it's also interesting to uh, see, I think, the last person who is talking about pride is talking actually uh, the notion of queer pride because there is this notion of um, you know, um, pride in um, uh, uh, IDF, meaning queerness in IDF. And of course, uh, many of you, oop, you're stuck here again. I don't know what's happening here. Oh, well. Um, let me go to that. So, of course, many of you uh, might have seen this. Uh, this is uh, a, a soldier, I, I, a IOF soldier, that says, in the name of love, the first uh, pride flag that was planted in Gaza. So, talking about queer imperialism and queer settler colonialism. Um, and, of course, uh, this idea of freedom of Israeli women um, mentions nothing about the fact that many Israeli women have been protesting for months now because of the uh, way that reproductive rights have uh, been uh, increasingly under attack in Israel. Uh, and you know this is a form of protest that happened just at the end of August um, in, uh, in Israel. So um, <clears throat> the social media propaganda is not just uh, spread through the official channels of IOF, but many TikTok or Instagram posts circulate in Persian where Hamas is portrayed as barbaric, monstrous uh, men who kill women and children. And it is exactly the appeal to people's emotions that makes many Iranians desensitized to the Israeli state's horrendous crimes in Gaza. Several posts that accuse Palestinians of lying um, and cruel comments at the videos of mourning Palestinians in Farsi accusing Palestinians of being liars and terrorists circulate in social media. Of course, despite the disproportionate violence in Gaza, which has made many human rights groups sp speak up against the Israeli genocide, hate, deception, um, hate, deception, and terror are the affective registers um, that attach to all Palestinian bodies through contagion. It's no longer Hamas that is to blame, who's to blame, and needs to pay for 1,200 Israeli deaths. It is all Palestinians. Um, so I should also say that it's not just the Israeli state's paid trolls, which they have 
quite uh, many of them. Uh, but it's just, you know, regular Iranians too. I had a trans woman uh, because of my work with uh, trans refugees, a former refugee who uh, uh, lived in, uh, in Canada uh, later, uh, attacked me on my Facebook for posting uh, about Palestine and calling me uh, and trying to insult me by saying that uh, I have no doubt that your mother was impregnated by an Arab and that's why you, you know, you're a self-hating Iranian and so on and so forth. And she's uh, trans and she <coughs> basically even went as far far as calling me um, a sick, you have the queer sickness for, um, for basically defending uh, Palestine and Palestinians. So uh, as I said, this kind of um, uh, propaganda is really doing the effective work that the Israeli states uh, intends to do. So uh, the first uh, uh, reason that I uh, said about the desensitization of many Iranians, um, in particular, you know, Iranian feminists is basically these kind of affective uh, ways that um, produce um, uh, the, uh, you know, so-called Islamists as the common enemy. Second is the Iranian nationalism and the anti-Arab sentiments among Iranians. Um, and this is basically uh, not new. The anti-Arab racism is partly due to the long-term historical <coughs> resentments towards the seventh century Islamization of Iran by Arabs. In refashioning Iran, Mohammad Tawakoli Targhi demonstrates that the rewriting of the pre-Islamic past by the neo-Mazdian Azari movement of the late 16th century and the 17th century in response to repressive religious policies of the Safavids endanger, uh, engen engendered a shift in Iranian historical consciousness. The emergence of modern Iranian identity was closely linked to the reconfiguration of national history that was informed by pre-Islamic mythical texts, and it involved the purification of language and geographical territorialization of an immemorial past. Tabakuli Tarqi points out that the 19th century history texts, which were influenced by Dasatir texts of the Azari movement, deployed a discourse that became pervasive in 19th century history writing. The trope of Muslim conquest and Arab invasion uh, were seen as the reason for the uh, dispersion of Iranians from their homeland. 19th century nationalist discourses also drew from the pre-Islamic past to fashion an enlightened Iranian identity prior to the advent of Islam in Iran. This anti-Arab territorial nationalism intensified during the Pahlavi period and became even more prevalent among some Iranians in Iran and its diaspora who saw the Islamic revolution of 1979 as the so-called second Arab invasion. As Tawakoli Tarqi has uh, argued, the modern nationalist uh, Iranian discourse assumes continuity between ancient and contemporary Iran and involves the taxon taxonomic partition, uh, partition of the history and destiny of peoples residing in the bounded territories of Iran from those of Arabs, uh, Indians, and Turks. Even as narratives of Aryan ancestry in the nationalist discourses of Iranianness have histories that precede the present moment, the anti-Iranian sentiment in the aftermath of the 1979 Iranian Revolution and the intensification of those sentiments during the war on terror, so-called war on terror, add layers to this problematic misidentification. Uh, that is, the desire for proximity to whiteness among some Iranians in diaspora is simultaneously a distancing and survival tactic. Whether it is the disassociation from the so-called Islamic regime and an appeal to the greatness of a Persian past because of the anti-Iranian hate violence in the aftermath of, uh, of course, the um, um, uh, Iranian revolution and the hostage crisis or after uh, September 11, the dominant trend among the Iranian diaspora who often identify as Persian rather than Iranian is to distinguish themselves from Arabs. Notwithstanding this distancing, the fact remains that Iranians are subjected to discriminatory policies that include sanctions or immigration restrictions such as the uh, Muslim ban under Trump. The model minority discourse has become quite prevalent in a time when Iranians are specifically named as undesirable immigrants in policies such as the Muslim ban. Um, uh, and you know, even though uh, the ban is no longer there, the sentiments are there. <coughs> Despite the, the, strat the strategic deployment of discourse, <coughs> 
the uh, Iranian diaspora uh, uses this, uh, you know, as a way to uh, erase any traces of Islam while, while recuperating a pre-Islamic Persian empire as the source of national pride. Nothing uh, uh, captures the desire for the revival of Iran's pre-Islamic glory more than the installation of the uh, and unveiling of the uh, so-called uh, Cyrus Cylinder, uh, which is a statue in um, Los Angeles, and it was <coughs> erected in 2017, shortly after Trump signed the Muslim ban. And this is the statue. The 2.2 million sculpture was a uh, 2.0 million dollar sculpture was unveiled by uh, Ali Rezaei, an Iranian American developer and the founding chairman of the Farhang Foundation. Uh, this 20,000 <coughs> pound piece made from gold and silver is a permanent fixture in Los Angeles's wealthy uh, Century City near the Westfield Century City Mall and at the gateway to Beverly Hills. The sculpture is inspired and represents the much celebrated Cyrus, Cyrus Cylinder, a 2,500-year-old uh, artifact which was unearthed by British archaeologists, of course, in southern Iraq in 1879 and has um, been kept at the British Museum ever since. The clay cylinder is a Babylonian account of the conquest of Babylon by the Persian king Cyrus in uh, 539 BC. It is supposed to attest to the Persian king's empathy for Jews who were deported from Babylon. The grotesque Cyrus Cylinder in Los Angeles is not just a reminder of Iran's glorious past, but it inevitably demands a historical amnesia that erases Islam from Iran's image while distinguishing Iranians from their Arab and Muslim neighbors, showing an alliance with Israel, you know, the freedom of Jews, in hopes of joining the ranks of the man of the liberal democracy. Drawing on Ray Cha and uh, Susan Koshy's work, Jasper Poir, <coughs> excuse me, has rightly noted that the ascendancy of whiteness through biopower incorporates complicit multicultural ethnic bodies. It is through the management of difference that certain cosmopolitan ethnic and often heteronormative or homonormative wealthy and exceptional patriots are tolerated while those suspected of terrorism often uh, marked as uh, you know, having pathological sexuality are deemed as intolerable ethnics. Proxim uh, proximity to whiteness becomes a matter of class while cultural difference is abrogated through proximity to class-based whiteness. Poir argues that for the ethnic with access to capital, both in terms of co uh, consumption and ownership, the seduction by global capital is conducted through racial amnesia, among other forms of forgetting. The unveiling of the silver gold statue of the cylinder on Independence Day in Los Angeles is not only a symbolic move to pledge allegiance to the United States, but the statue's unnecessary extravagance also signals to the market virility of cosmopolitan diaspora Iranians who identify with the pre-Islamic, of course, Aryan, uh, Persia while actively disidentifying with Iran's Islamic past and present. The, iron the irony of this claim uh, of Iranianness is, of course, the complete erasure of the fact that anti-Semitism has been a white supremacist European invention, but somehow the royalist Iranians, who were very much you know, a fan of this, who consider themselves to be Aryans, find themselves in alliance with Israel. Uh, this is a total erasure, of course, of Reza Shah's alliance with Hitler and rampant anti-Semitism during Mohammad Reza Pahlavi's reign. Yet the post-revolutionary state becomes responsible for anti-Semitism in Iran. And of course, this is not to say that anti-Semitism does not exist in post-revolutionary Iran or among ranks of the Islamic Republic. But to assume that, the, uh, uh, that we live in, um, you know, uh, before revolution, we lived in a Mamlekat of Golubolbol, like this, you know, <laughs> wonderful place where anti-Semitism was non-existent is uh, basically a myth. How much time do I have? <laughs> Five minutes. Five minutes, oh my god, okay. So I'm gonna try to um, get to the last one. Uh, I, I have a few points, few reasons that I consider to be uh, why people are so hesitant to talk about Palestine. Uh, but another reason 
that I see is opposition to, Islam <coughs> to the Islamic Republic. Part of the reason for the anti-Palestinian sentiments, or you know, basically silence, desensitization um, in Iran and its diaspora is the opposition to the Islamic Republic of Iran. Many people rightly have argued that the Iranian state's claims of freedom for Palestine uh, when social freedoms are repressed in Iran are hypocritical. In a way, part of the reaction to Palestine, either you know, the anti-Palestinian slogans that uh, you have probably seen in social media or in the stadium, the kind of very homophobic slogans of sticking the flag up you know, someone's ass. Um, these are all basically, um, um, uh, they come really, uh, they're, they're in a sense a reaction to the Islamic Republic, right? The logic here is that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Uh, other than social freedoms, the dire economic reality in Iran has pushed many Iranians to see the Iranian state's help to Hamas and Hezbollah as competition against the Iranian people. Uh, right? So the slogans of neither Gaza nor Lebanon, na Gaza, na Lebanon, John and Fadaya Iran were prevalent in gas price, uh, when the gas price uh, uh, went up, the um, water protests, cuts in subsidies and protests against privatization, all of which were directly related to the sanctions and sanctions profiteering. Sanctions in particular after 2010 when Obama impose the so-called um, crippling sanctions on Iran and later you know, after JCPOA uh, was uh, withdrawn by Trump. Uh, they have created a very um, horrifying economic si uh, situation for uh, many Iranians, in particular those who live in the margins of society, including working class trans women, including Af Afghan refugees. Um, so, um, you know, this is basically why with the current economic situation, um, Iranians are adamantly against uh, the uh, Iranian state's support to Palestine. Um, and of course, the woman life freedom, uh, which became all about hijab, was not just about hijab. Many women with hijab also participated in the woman life freedom protest. And it was also about women's freedom and bodily integrity as much as it was about economic injustice, inflation, privatization, and the suppression, uh, suppression of unions, which basically, you know, um, the, the, this kind of pented up and after Maso Gina Amini's death at the hands of the guidance petrol ignited years of discontent um, with the uh, Iranian state. Uh, of course, during the Zans and the Yozadi, we didn't see Naqaz and Lebanon, John and Fadai Iran. There was a difference uh, in the movement that was very much, you know, uh, working to make these connections. But unfortunately, again, uh, we see uh, the very strong anti-Palestinian sentiments, and again, they have to do with the Iranian states' um, suppression of uh, freedom and also the economic situation. Um, so uh, I know that I'm out of time. I wanted to talk about a couple of other reasons, but we can bring those in uh, Q&A. Uh, I'll just mention it here. Part of the reason uh, that I think our colleagues uh, in uh, you know, feminist uh, gender and sexuality studies uh, so bravely talked about woman life freedom and are not talking about Palestine is because a particular kind of knowledge production is marketable, right? <laughs> so when you're talking about woman life freedom, of course, you know, uh, there are opportunities for public talks, you get basically celebrated, but talking about Palestine means that you get doxxed, right? You get harassed, as many of us have. <laughs> you know, we are on, <laughs> how many of you are on Canary Mission? Yeah, so uh, that's the difference. And I think, you know, uh, that part, for good reasons too, people are careful. But I think, you know, for those of us who have tenure, uh, there's no excuse to be silent about Palestine. I understand when we have colleagues who are not tenured yet and they're attacked actually most viciously by the Israeli lobby. But for those, those of us who are tenured, I think if we are talking about feminist, if we think about feminist scholarship, if we think about social justice as a part of, um, uh, you know, feminist rhetoric, then we cannot separate these causes. We really na need to make these connections and uh, be vocal about Palestine. And I would love to talk to you guys about, you know, what strategies you use here at Princeton um, and what has worked, what hasn't worked, and do some kind of, you know, brainstorming about solidarity moves that we can organize together. Thank you so much. Awesome. Now it's
10 p.m. tonight. But um, <laughs> for now, I was really curious about the figure you offered about uh, the amount of funding that Israel is supporting <coughs> YouTube ads alone. Is that, if I'm not mistaken, you said $7 million? Could you tell us more? Just in two weeks, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about, like, how do, how do you find out that much money? Like, like how, did you, how do you know that? And then, like, do you have any sense of how much money is being spent in, like, Instagram <laughs> or TikTok, right? Like, there's the whole TikTok scandal where yeah. um, TikTok came out and said, no, we're not, we're not messing with the algorithm. The teams are just very good. Can you talk a little bit more about the media aspect? Sure. Um, so... The first part, how do I know about this? Because I was actually looking at you know, how, how much Israel is funding. And the only information I could fi uh, find, which, which is available, you can just Google it, was on several news media that <coughs> mentioned that. Uh, I didn't find anything about TikTok or Instagram. But if you're on TikTok and Instagram, you can see <laughs> you know, the level of propaganda that is happening. But also knowing that, as I said, since 2005, Israel actually started this brand Israel, right? This campaign that basically, uh, in particular, focused on the so-called Western nations to kind of change their minds about Israel. Uh, it's not surprising to me that during this particular time, Israel is putting even more money into propaganda. But uh, it's not, you know, a um, uh, it's not a secret that Israel has been running the uh, brand Israel. Uh, campaign since 2005, and a lot of that has been going to pinkwashing, basically. And um, you know, if you talk to queer scholars who um, do research on um, pinkwashing, you can see the amount of money that Israel has spent you know, on on that campaign, producing all these videos um, about you know how free queers are, you know, gays in the military, and so on and so forth. And the ones that I show from IDF are just a few, and they, these are, you know, the kind of shameless IDF ones, but there are also th the other ones. And, you know, uh, again, if you Google it, you'll see that how much money Israel spends in hiring trolls to actually um, harass those who are um, speaking about Palestine. And uh, in terms of media, you know, my book uh, on Weblogistan talks about this kind of, you know, uh, propaganda that the uh, U.S. Department of Sp uh, State spent uh, on um, uh, propaganda in Iran, right? Uh, so, again, uh, I, uh, my, my project was very much focused on Weblogistan, and much of the funding came from the U.S. Department of State and uh, some from Dutch government. Um, at that point, I didn't find anything about Israel funding uh, those, but uh, I was talking to um, Behruz a little bit earlier, and those of us who have been attacked by the Israeli lobby, and I was, but you know, I left Wellesley College exactly <laughs> because of that. Uh, uh, I was bullied out of Wellesley College. Um, can see how the strategies that reappeared during the uh, woman life freedom, those of us who were, you know, I haven't been to Iran in 34 years, and I've been accused of working for the Islamic Republic of Iran. You know, I'm called the whore of a mullah, I'm called, you know, whatever you call it, you name it, I've been called. Um, but the strategies of bullying are exactly the same. It's as if, you know, it's the textbook kind of, you know, bullying that um, the Zionist lobby used um, in 2012 when I was, you know, when the attacks were happening in uh, Gaza. And um, the, the similarities are just uncanny, you know. So, um, but yeah, it's, you know, if you just Google, uh, you'll find so much information about how much Israel spends on propaganda. And that's exactly, uh, you know, it's kind of, uh, Jasper Poir in her books talks also about, you know, the right to maim, that because Israel uh, was really in deep shit because of his wa uh, war crimes, uh, they came up with this kind of shoot to maim policy rather than killing, right, which Poir rather than the, you know, necropol necropolitical, uh, you know, how um, biopolitics Ill, uh, is about um, uh, 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 oh my god. Thank you. <laughs> make live, let die. Uh, and necropolitic is about basically making die. Uh, Poir talks about will not let die, 
which is basically keeping um, the population in Gaza on min minimum calories to keep the population barely alive and also disabling an entire population or actually you know, uh, maiming and uh, debilitating an entire population uh, with minimum calories to keep them barely alive. Um, so, but exactly because of the war crimes of the Israeli state, these campaigns for building the image of Israel has been uh, very much uh, a part of um, uh, the strategy of the Israeli state. Game where they are at once presenting themselves as the good Muslim mm -hmm. to be used against the pro-Palestinian Arab Muslim, yes. while also denouncing Islam and uh, saying all kinds of Islamophobic things, yes. and then at the same time also bringing forward uh, the Iranian Jewish experience. And I'm curious if you can talk to both of those yeah. as how they relate to all of this. Yeah. That's, that's, a, um, that's an excellent uh, excellent point, and I think you know the model minority uh, concept that I was talking about is a part of that, right? So the idea of good Muslim or bad Muslim, which really during the 9/11 um, uh, started with Bush, you know, calling uh, sisters and cover or whatnot to kind of differentiate between the bad Muslims and the good Muslims, and I think the Iranian diaspora is not. Um, exempt from that, of course, you know, tapping into opportunities that uh, are produced exactly because of this idea of um, uh, the neoliberal multiculturalism uh, that basically uh, produces a particular idea of what what it means to be a Muslim and inclusion, you know, all the DEI kind of measures that we have in the universities and all that, but at the same time denouncing the deviant Muslim, right? The, uh, the uh, perverted Hamas who basically kidnaps women and rapes them and so on and so forth. So that is definitely a part of that differentiation that happens. And of course, again, through this idea of, you know, uh, good Muslim and using the nationalistic re rhetorics that we saved Jews in the first place, right? <laughs> so kind of using both uh, the nationalist uh, Iranian discourses bringing the multicultural, uh, you know, the neoliberal multicultural aspect of good Muslim and bringing those together to negotiate uh, uh, a kind of a legitimate space uh, within the context uh, where one has to be really, and you know, the last point that I was saying in university is really connected to neoliberal self-entrepreneurship, right? How to promote yourself with your scholarship and what is marketable. Does that answer to your question? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I was thinking about how shortly after 9-11, uh, uh, Judith Butler had kind of had seen how um, the blogosphere had basically allowed Arab people, like Arab voices, to come through and attest to the like, backlash to 9-11. And, or another way, like in Edward Said's terms, like basically that they created a space for people to claim the permission to narrate. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was thinking of your work and on Web Blogistan, and I was thinking that one of the sort of like insistences of that work was that Web Blogistan was a place of where basically of a normalization of discourse. Mm -hmm. um, so you have like this kind of text there, right? Of yeah. The blogosphere is a place where people can claim the permission to narrate, mm -hmm. but then the problematic that's the Vogue talks about yeah. that problem that like legibility imposed. Imp like to be legible, we have to be proper. To be proper. Yeah. So there's actually narration is a double-edged sword, right? Yeah. She agrees. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, it seems though that like the media landscape has changed so much, especially the digital landscape. Like Vita was saying, how like they're not doing anything to the algorithm. It's just that like, the, the youth just have to be like heavily pro-Palestine. Yeah. It seems like the terrain is in fact like so much more anarchic that perhaps. Like, <laughs> The sort of maybe like the normalization that we saw in the blogosphere is starting to break down. Yep. And so I'm basically, I was wondering if you could reflect upon 
sort of the way in which discourse around Palestine has changed, especially post October 7th, and the sort of insights and sort of the, the, the sort of uh, insights you were deriving from the way in which power functioned in Blagistan mm -hmm. uh, when you were doing your research. Thank you. Can That's... I collect the last question? Sure. Researcher and probably pretty familiar in differentiating um, misinformation and information. And if you wanted to um, look at um, some of the sources that you uh, used in your presentation today, um, could you name some of them so that we could have a look at them? Definitely. Um, so let me respond to Navid first. Um, Navid, right? Yeah. Right. Um, so that's an excellent point, and I think um, uh, the, the uh, one of the reviews that came, um, you know, from my book was Elirza Duster, who basically says that you know I'm focusing. And Elirza and I were bloggers together. We wrote, you know, um, a group blog, No War on Iran, together, and all that. And of course, there were voices that were, uh, you know, uh, Elirza, <laughs> Nikki Ahavan, and some other people. Um, who were not a part of what I'm talking about, right, in the book. Um, what I'm focusing uh, on the book are representable blogger subjects, those actually who made it into mainstream news as representatives, like you know, or the book um, We Are Iran, you know, on uh, uh, the bloggers and so on and so forth. So in that book, I'm particularly talking about the mainstream representations of web bloggers at the time, and that's of course a very particular time. Blogs are kind of like irrelevant now, <laughs> right? Um, but at the height of blogging, where blogging was seen as uh, the you know where civil society flourishes for the first time, Iranian women have the chance to speak, and so on and so forth, um, and the kind of funding that was put into hiring bloggers to write for mainstream news, rules, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, my focus was really, um, you know, to kind of go against that glorification of Weblogistan as revolutionary, as, you know, this and that, um, as the site of freedom, we are practicing democracy, to write about basically how the very heteronormative <laughs> ideas of Iranianness, very classed ideas of Iranianness, very racist ideas of Iranianness are reproduced in Weblogistan by some of these gurus of blogging, right? Uh, but you're right. Of course, you know, things have changed. N you know, blogging even has changed since then, but, you know, after blogging there was Fairfair, Friends Free, free then, you know, um, Goder, Google Read, and then, you know, turned into Twitter and so on and so forth, which completely has a different medium, different way of um, writing even, um, and uh, uh, different ways that people uh, engage with each other. So I, um, I do agree that actually a lot of what we see that is happening in Gaza is exactly because of people who are tweeting, you know, um, and that goes back to your question about kind of the information. Um, I can actually send a link, a link to uh, Behrouz. Many of you probably have seen it. People who are basically the uh, tweeting from Gaza. Many of them no longer are because they're either injured or dead. Uh, but basically there is a list of people who create content from Gaza rather than kind of, you know, the kind of propaganda that we see. And of course the kind of news, mainstream news in the US which is very overwhelmingly pro-Israel. Um, but um, there, uh, you know, I, uh, I think uh, the Ali Reza's uh, critique of my book was that I focus so much on um, the kind of, uh, this idea of neoliberal uh, entrepreneurship and the war machine, the thinking about you know politics of right rule killing in a way, uh, the way that Iranian popu population becomes killable in the name of rights and through these discourses of freedom in blogging and so on and so forth, um, that I do not really talk about uh, dissent or you know voices of dissent in web bloggers and that's a valid critique. But my point was really like you know focusing on um, the representable um, uh, bloggers uh, at the time when blogging was considered to be the um, kind of, you know, whatever you call it, the shit. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but <laughs> yeah. So um, so uh, yeah. Obviously, things have changed, and you know, I think it's really important to actually look at, uh, despite the algorithms and despite the kind of censorship that we see very clearly happening in Facebook and in um, uh, other social media, but still the, that possibility um, is very much present uh, in, uh, in the case, especially after October 7th. And I would say even though Israel has killed so many people in Gaza, uh, Israel is really losing this war. Yeah, because more and more people, we see more and more people actually standing up for Palestine. Um, and uh, to, uh, to respond to your question, I will send a link to Behruz maybe, and uh, you can uh, send it to people who are interested about where to read, maybe. I'm sorry. Uh, we are talking about ways of solidarity and how to create awareness about it. That's the least you can do. Sorry. <laughs>